That's just so nice. So what does it mean to welcome someone? To help them feel valued, seen, accepted for who they are, just as they are? Is it simply saying, hey, how are you? I don't know. Maybe think for a moment when you felt welcomed. Has there been a situation where you really felt that somebody welcomed you? What did that look like? Do you think what works in what worked in your case when you felt welcome will be the case for every person or every situation? I'm asking these questions this morning because every week someone new walks in our doors in hopes that they'll be welcome. As Unitarian Universalists, many of us have this strong individualist idea. And so I'm pretty sure that we understand that every person is an individual, that we welcome each person who walks in our doors as an individual, each in a unique way. Well, there may be some ideas that might help us know how, not just in our church, but in life, to make someone feel welcomed. To welcome is to gladly receive someone, to accept them, to appreciate them, to show them hospitality, treating them in a, in a warm and friendly, a generous way. To allow them to see, to allow them to see, to allow them to know that you see them as someone who deserves worth and dignity. And I think we know this, many of us, or at least we intend this. But we sometimes forget when we welcome someone, that's not a one-size-fits-all expression of welcoming. We need to work out what it means to be welcoming. I'll tell you a little bit about welcoming. You know, this congregation has completed what's called a welcoming congregation program to improve an awareness of how to be welcoming to someone who isn't heteronormative. Some of you might remember that this congregation had discussions about honoring people's pronouns. These are a little list of pronouns that, that have come from uh, young people particularly who are uh, gender fluid. And, and how important it is to them that we use the pronoun that they prefer. And, and we talked about this when we, were, we, had, we had actually permanent name tags at one point, and we will again, um, that we ask you to, to put on your, your name tags your pronouns as a symbol and sign that pronouns are important and that you respect other people's pronouns. For those people who come in and might wonder, And, and members of this congregation are participating in a book study, learning how to de-center whiteness in our worship, in our relationships, in our community. What we're learning helps us to be more welcoming to people of color by intentionally trying not to center our worship on whiteness on a white culture. So what does that mean? Well, let me, let me give you some examples because this is a, it's difficult to unpack. We don't always know what centering on whiteness is in worship or relationships. 
So I, I took a passage from Decentering Whiteness in Worship by Erica, Erica Hewitt, and she's the Unitarian Universalist Association Minister of Worship Arts, and Julica de Fuente, de la Fuente, Director of uh, Liberation and Transformation Ministries at the First Universalist Church in Minneapolis. Hewitt and uh, La Fuente first talk about this idea that sometimes in worship we feel like we need to control what happens. You know, and, and if they don't go as we feel like they should, we, we, this control thing that's inside of us that we want things to be this way might manifest in many assumptions or feelings or, or statements. Like, our worship service should go as it always has with the same order of service and end in an hour. You know, we get so over-attached to the way we've always done things. That, too, is part of that. You know, we, so we have to have a prelude. We have to have a postlude. We have to do things the way we've always done them. And one thing that we do in this denomination so often is prioritizing thought and intellect over feelings and embodiment. White Protestant culture taught us to seek comfort in information, buttressing the myth of objectivity. We struggle with this, embodying worship. It's hard for us to move our bodies, to clap in service. We do this, that's fine. It is our bodies we're moving and important. It's not that we come here every Sunday to be intellectually stimulated. And, and we don't come here to be one age. Our children should be with us. And some might say, that's, you know, to have a child in a worship service is disruptive or distracting. Well, it's life. It's embodying. It's, it's reacting in the moment. It's hard to change how we've always done things and, the, and how white culture is so much entrenched in our worship. You know, Hewitt and De La Fuente say we need to move beyond a culture of control, an ethic of control, if you will, to be more open to risk and flexibility and difference, to trust when we walk in to a worship service that we will be inspired, perhaps. But most of all, that we surrender to our need to know what's going to happen in the next moment and exercise our muscle of exploring, open to the idea that we don't know what we don't know until we experience it. We might not realize that our own deepest anti-racism, anti-oppression work requires us to be in our bodies. And that feeling comes up through our bodies as we engage with one another, as we worship with one another. We exercise that part of us open to transformation. Being curious, open, 
flexible, willing to explore our central tenets of Unitarian Universalism, at least as I understand Unitarian Universalism. And these tenets are actively in play during worship and in our personal interactions with each other, particularly when we're interacting with someone we don't know. Now, you may or may not have heard a lot about this intent and impact. So I want to open us up to that as we, as we really think about welcoming either, again, together in this congregation or out into the world. All of us, I believe, I believe that all of us, when we interact with another person, do it with a loving heart. Trying to show the person that they are valued, accepted, welcomed, and in this space that there is a place for them. And I think many of you have realized that one point or another, that not everything that we do to make someone feel valued and accepted actually communicates that message. How many of you experienced when you said something to someone with a loving heart that the impact was not what was heard or experienced by them. And I want to say that, and this is hard, that intent is less important than impact. Let's say you're, you're curious. You meet someone and you're curious about the way that they're dressed. Or, or the style of their hair. And you say to them, again, with a loving heart and intention, why are you dressed that way? Or can I touch your hair? How does that feel? What do they experience? Do they hear in their minds, why do you look like that? This type of curiosity is not about getting to know someone or understanding them better, or even if in this community, what brings them to a Unitarian Universalist church, which might be a spiritual home that they've been searching for. You just might be trying to open a conversation. But the impact is the thing. They may experience that they think that you believe that they're different and might not be accepted by you. When I was serving a church in DuPage Unitarian Universalist Church, I'd gotten to the church early one Sunday morning and, and you know, was getting ready for, for the service. And a young man came in. He was, he was in a wheelchair, like one of those electric wheelchairs. And he was clearly unable to use his hands or, and his upper body even seemed not stable. He was moving around. And, and he wasn't making words. He, he, he couldn't articulate words. And, you know, and, and he was staring up at the ceiling as, he, as his body kind of moved. And, and I didn't go over to him. I, I just wondered where his caretaker was. You know, I heard an electric sound. I don't know. It just sounded like beeps and I don't know what it was. I didn't recognize it as words. 
I just, you know, kind of waved, acknowledging him. His mother came in, and, you know, she came over to me, and she said he was trying to talk to me. And he was hurt that I didn't respond to him. I stopped what I was doing, and I walked over, and I, I told him I was sorry. I, I didn't acknowledge him. I didn't respond to him. I didn't understand he was trying to communicate. But he could hear me, understand me, and respond to me in a different way than I was used to. I made him feel unheard, unseen, unwelcome. And I know that we have to be aware of how we connect to others. Whether it be here or, or in our life, I, I think here is a, a place, and our, and our congregation is a place where we can practice being with one another, welcoming one another, and we can take those skills out into the world and we can help people who join us know that they are respected and welcomed. Now, Chris, if you would join me. We're going to go through and have a little conversation. And in this conversation, Chris is going to be someone entering our church on a Sunday morning. And, uh, you know, Chris and I, as you can see, are white heteronormative, able-bodied. So as we have this conversation, um, I want you to imagine that, that Chris represents someone who isn't all that. Hello, uh, I'm Reverend Tom Capo, the minister here. Hi, I'm Chris Kirshner. <laughs> I'm glad you're visiting um, here at UU Miami. Uh. What exactly is you, you? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's shorthand for Unitarian Universalist. You know, we forget sometimes here and use acronyms. I, I hope you'll continue to ask us when we say something with an acronym and, and, and you want to know what it means. Yeah, sure, I will. Okay. Now, if, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them about, you know, Unitarian Universalism or this congregation, um, just anything at all. No, I'm just visiting. I don't, I don't really have any questions right now. Okay. Uh, is, uh, is it okay for me to ask how you heard about us? Uh, well, yeah, I was doing some work on the computer. A website, uh, belief.net, uh, was part of the research on different religions and spiritual practices. So I took their quiz and on the belief meter it said I was most likely a Unitarian Universalist and I didn't know what that was. Um, I found the website and your, your Facebook page. I watched a couple of the uh, services on YouTube and um, I, I still wasn't sure that this was the place for me. You know it's hard to kind of know what a faith is until you meet the people that have that belief. So once you opened up with the safety protocols in place, I decided to come and check it out. Well, well I, you know, I took the belief a meter too, and it said I was mostly Unitarian Universalist, but it was, I also could be a Quaker or a, a Buddhist even. Um, after you took that belief a meter, did you pin down how to describe yourself? I mean, I mean spiritually mean. Uh, no, uh, I just feel like I'm a searcher. Um, there are many religions and philosophies that I'm, I'm interested in. I'm a, a, a person who's interested in a lot. Hmm. That sounds very much like a lot of people here at, at UU Miami. Uh, I'm happy you decided to check us out. I, I believe that you'll find there's a place for you if, if you find a home here. Uh, in this congregation. And I really want you to know that we believe each person here has a voice in the direction of the congregation. 
how we worship, how we govern ourselves, everything. Um, we co-create this congregation. Um, by the way, uh, you know, do you live locally? Uh, yeah, I live within, you know, 10 or 15 minutes up the Palmetto here. Well, I live in Kendall. I've, you know, I've been here, I've just been here a little while, so I'm still getting to know Miami. I've been, you know, the minister here anyway. Um, and I noticed your necklace. Uh, is there a story connected to that? Well, yes, there's a story beyond the fact that it looks like fingernails. Um, my mother gave this to me as I was going away to college. She was quite a colorful lady. And every time I wear it, I kind of feel connected to her. Uh, now, your tie is also uh, quite colorful. Yeah, I, I really like wearing different ties. Yeah, I, I feel like um, when I get dressed up to be in church, I can only wear like solid color shirts, shirts and pants. You know, I also wear colorful socks. I have my, my fish socks on today. Um, you know, I just want to brighten things up a little bit. Um, but it's been lovely talking to you, but I've got to go preach. So um, I'll, I'll be around after the service. And by the way, there's some pamphlets in the back if you'd like to look at them. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, if you want me to, I can introduce you to someone else in the congregation who can help you as you get settled in. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, for Chris, for doing that. <laughs> now, no conversation is going to go perfectly, even one that's scripted. <clears throat> it's because in our brains we tend to criticize and take apart what we think could have been done better. That's too part of being in a white supremacy culture. That's not to say that, that our experiences can't be something that we learn from and grow from and find new ways to do things that we, than what we used to do. Now, as I said, this conversation we had seemed to be between two people who are socially comfortable with one another. I assume you noticed that we, we felt at ease having this conversation. However, not everybody who comes in our congregation who comes into our lives, for instance, um, has that level of comfort in interacting or wants to be in a, a, a lengthy conversation, a somewhat lengthy conversation. I do think it's important to us that we're sensitive to others as we engage with them. And if they, they're not wanting to talk, we don't try to push that on them. That's, you know, it's, it's not our role um, to make someone new get to know us. They're in their own space. We have to respect that. One more thing I, I mentioned before Chris and I had this conversation that Chris was someone, I wanted you to imagine that Chris was someone who was not white or heteronormative or able-bodied. Maybe a person who was differently abled or gender fluid or transgender or person of color, something different. And I wonder, how would those, any of those descriptors have impacted the conversation between Chris and I or between you and, and someone else? So the message is, my friends, I hope it wouldn't impact it very much, if at all. And we engage people as they are a human being, not a label, not a descriptor. I wrote this script, and I tried to keep a few things in mind. General ideas that I thought might be helpful when we interact with people, whether it's here and we're greeting somebody new walking in these doors, or whether we're meeting somebody new in our lives. Be curious, not by creating, not by wanting to, to be curious because we, we want to know something about them that's going to make us feel better, 
But what we're doing in a, this curiosity is holding a safe space for that person to share what they're comfortable sharing. And be respectful, flexible, open. Don't always try to be in control of the conversation. Share, I shared about myself with Chris a little, as well as wanting to know about her. You know, if I'm just talking about myself, I'm not having a conversation, I'm giving a speech. Now, in this congregation, we want to know, people to know that there is a, that this is a safe place, a place where they can feel at home if they want to. And I think that's true of any space that we're in. It, we want them to feel like this is a place you can be, even in my own presence. This is a, this is a space I'm open to being with you. It's important. Now, I, I mentioned that this is a co-created community because that's something unusual about Unitarian Universalism. It's not something people generally experience in other churches or communities. It's, it's an unusual experience. So I want to be sure to mention that. And in any conversation, any conversation, if there is an unintended impact, in this case it was using an acronym, an insider jargon, that we stop the conversation and deal with the feelings, talk with them about it. Getting to know them is less important then. And, and I walked away because I had to go something, do something. And I didn't want them just to feel abandoned. You know, like, oh, you know, you're not that important. I'm just going to go off and do what I need to do. I, I said, do you, would you like someone to be with you? I mean, introduce you to someone who might continue to help you as you settle in. Why is greeting, making someone feel welcomed and worthy and accepted important here at UU Miami? Well, my friends, I want you to think of it this way. We are like human doorways, portals to Unitarian Universalism for those who come to our congregation. And in, and in doing and in doing this greeting and trying to be more intentionally welcoming, we're also learning more about ourselves, enriching our own lives, as well as the life of the congregation. Intentionally, from love, and consciously practicing certain skills about how to get to know someone, you, know, you learn more about yourself. You learn some of your everyday assumptions that might lead to people with identities different from yours to feel less welcome. You learn how to more deepest, deeply and unselfishly connect to another person. And you learn to be more effective in expressing another person's inherent worth and dignity. Let's remember that when people come through our doors, that they call us to kindness and questions. There is no one like them and there never will be again. That they matter, they really do, and we'll keep learning from them and we'll learn together. And we will offer them the opportunity to stand on our shoulders so that they can see what they can do and who they can become with us. Amen.